Well, good morning. Yes, remember, people are in the room. You have to say it back. Good morning. All right, there we go. I'm glad to be here with you today as we continue our series called uh, How to Deal with an Injustice. As you know, we put a pause on our series essentials so we could dust, discuss and talk about, well, injustices. As you know, there's a current outcry in our community and in our nation about racial injustices. And, and I want to be clear that this series isn't just about that, although it does speak to that. This, I hope, will help all of us navigate injustices just a little bit better because, unfortunately, as Christians, we're not known for dealing with these hard things very well. And so the goal is to help you and to help me, to help us navigate our way through injustices that we may face, that others may face, or if there's a nationwide outcry for them, because injustices aren't going away anytime soon. But hopefully the church, hopefully as Christians, we can do things a little differently. As we saw last week, as Christians representing Jesus in all that we do, we must be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to anger. Who does that perfectly here? Just two of us. Okay, Chuck, just you. You should be preaching then. You got this? Yeah, okay, okay. But so first we are to listen with our ears and our hearts open when when people are speaking in This week, I don't know about you, but from what I've heard, many people have had a lot of different conversations about what's going on in our nation, and I'm glad we're talking about it. I'd heard from many of you about it. And so today, uh, the sermon's going to be a little different than I originally planned, but today's the follow-up question that I've heard and perhaps you've heard. The follow-up to listening is, okay, now, now I've heard, now what can I do? I mean, what's my part? If there is an injustice in the world, if something is going on, and I hear that there is one, and I'm listening, and I feel there's one, and I understand, and I'm trying, what am I supposed to do next? And this is where things just get complicated, and this is where things get difficult. So part two of this series we're going to talk about today, well, it's engage and influence. Engage and influence. You see, several years ago at my previous church, our church wanted to do things maybe a little bit differently for missions. We were looking for other opportunities, and we looked to our state mission board at what they were doing, looked at their options, and one of the things they were working on was uh, an orphanage and, and ministry in Haiti. So I made some calls, talked to the right people, and listened about all the different things that was going on there and all the different needs they had, and it seemed like with what they needed and the giftings of our church, perhaps we would be a great fit. And I'm sure most of you remember, just to catch you up, in 2010, they were struck with that massive earthquake. It's estimated that over 300,000 people died, and around a million people were displaced. And so Virginia Baptist funded and started an orphanage there uh, in conjunction with the Baptist Association in Haiti to, to bring displaced children together. It was one of many that was started. And after listening, right, which of course is the first step, so many ideas went through my head about how we could help. And so many ideas went through the other persons, the leader of our representative in America, how we could help. And we had many different things that we thought, hey, this is what we could do. This is how it would work. And so we went over there, me and a group of leaders from our church, we went to Haiti to engage with the culture. And overwhelmed doesn't begin to describe how I felt when I got there. The different needs and what was taking place. I mean, you can hear about something. You can see a picture of something. But until you smell it and until you're in it, you can't begin to understand. And what I found out is all the answers that I had already come up with from listening, all the things I thought that I could do and that they needed, I found weren't at all the right answers, weren't at all things that they needed. You see, the things we thought they needed, me and actually another professional, he's just a great man. The things we thought they needed when we went over there, we found out wasn't the things they needed at all. 
The things they needed was something completely different, but it wasn't until we engaged, until we ate with them, until we really dialogued with them, until we built relationships with them, until we spent time where they were at, could we truly see what they needed. We heard them. You see, we have to be careful, and I want us to learn from my mistakes because I was talking to a professional missionary, and I don't say that lightly. I mean, this is what he did and, and what looked good to him and what sounded good to him and what looked good to me, and we just thought we had this thing going, but when we got there, we figured out that, oh, no, 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 no. They needed something completely different. I mean, we, it was so different. See, it's not enough to just listen. We must engage. We must go to where the people are. And this is rooted in the character of God himself. It's what this scholar James Davis Hunter calls God's faithful presence. And I want to talk about that for a little bit today, you see, because throughout the passages of Scripture, in fact, it starts off telling us about God speaking. Do you remember that? That he spoke and everything came into existence. And we are told that God's word is powerful, that he can just speak and create something out of nothing. And even though he is so powerful by his speaking, he still chooses to engage with us. He still chooses to pursue us. He still chooses to identify with us. Luke 19.10, Jesus says, For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. You see, although the world was broken, although the world was sinful, he chose to come and pursue humans. I mean, that's the big deal and the thing about the incarnation. And remember, the incarnation is where God wrapped himself in human flesh and came and dwelt among us. Did God need to dwell among us to know us? He created us. He already knew. He could have spoke, but instead he came to be present with us. Jesus jumped into the middle of the mess. How many of us want to stay away from the mess? Let's be honest. Like the mess is over there. I'm good. You know what? I might even give you some money so you go into the mess. But I don't want to get in the mess. But Jesus jumped right down and came in the middle. He didn't wait for us to ask for help. He came to us because he knew we needed the help. So he not only pursues us, and what's so intertwined with the incarnation is that he identified with us. He became like us. Philippians 2.7 says, Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. He became like us so he could pull us out of the mess. He He became like us so he could pull us to become like him. And the amazing thing about it is Jesus doesn't play it safe. He doesn't just go to the priests and the prophets. He doesn't just, well, if I was Jesus, I would have come in the 21st century, not the first century, right? We have AC. That would have been like, if I'm going to go visit the world, I'm not going to go to the Middle East without an air conditioner in 38. Like, I'm, I'm just not going to do that. But he jumped into the middle of the mess identified with us, doesn't play it safe. In fact, throughout the Gospels, we see Jesus engaging with people that others thought Well, I don't want anything to do with them. You see, during the time of Jesus, well, the Jews were under the control of Rome. Rome was clearly in charge, more the most powerful nation the world had ever seen up until that point. But Rome had a very different strategy for conquering people. They would take over a land, and they would win if there was a war, but they would let the people who inhabited that land still practice their religion and still use their customs. And so they would influence people towards them by kind of, you know, just influencing them, but not making them believe the same thing or act a certain way. But Rome said, this is our land. We'll let you live here and practice the way you want. But, I mean, you got to pay us taxes, right? We're Rome. I mean, governments always want taxes, don't they? I just said, yes, yes, they do. Yeah, so they still needed their taxes. But what they found is instead of taking a Roman citizen and putting in the middle of a different culture and trying to figure out who has what money, because remember they didn't have computers and spreadsheets and your employer didn't report, you know, like all that stuff we have now. Instead of doing that and people could hide and lie and say, we're poor, we don't have money, they would employ someone from the native land, in this case a Jewish person. They would employ a Jewish person to be the tax collector for Rome. And so I'm a Jewish person. 
let's say you're Jews, Rome would employ me, and I know who's rich. I know who has money. It's one thing to hide it for the Romans who don't know you, but you can't hide it for me because I've been here my whole life, or you've been here your whole life. And so I know who has what. So as you can imagine, that tax collector was considered a traitor. You know, they were supporting the man. And they had an entire Roman army to back them up. And the amazing thing about their job is they worked on commission. Well, kind of. I not only collected from you what you owed, I collected some for myself. And are you going to say no to me with a Roman army? Nope. So I benefited at your expense. I mean, they were looked at as the person who was helping, helping Rome oppress their nation. Because they're supposed to be the people of God. They're supposed to have this thing. And they were looked very down upon. But see, that doesn't stop Jesus. Although the tax collectors were despised, hated, and considered wicked and corrupt. Matthew 9 tells us this. Matthew 9, 9, it says this. Jesus went on from there. He saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax collector's booth. Follow me, he told them. Follow me, he told him. And Matthew got up and followed him. Look at this next part. And when Jesus was having dinner at Matthew's house, he went and had a party. Many tax collectors and sinners came and ate with him and his disciples. I mean, it doesn't say the word party, but if you're at someone's house and then all of your friends and other friends come and then you bring your friends along, what do we call that? Yeah, they had a party. This person who was despised, this person who doesn't like, Jesus goes over and hangs out with. And this word here for sinner carries the idea of the most criminal and disreputable people in their society. Jesus not only seeks them and says, hey, you can follow me. He goes out and hangs out with his friends and eats and shares a meal. And back then, eating was by far, it still is today, very intimate. But back then, it was the most intimate thing you could do with other people. Of course, that wasn't your spouse. You get what I'm saying? Because they'd be sitting down at a table. They'd be reclining, all sticking their hand in the same pot of food. There was no hand sanitizer, right? I mean, they would just share and eat from the same thing. It was very intimate. intimate. And these were the social outcasts. But notice Jesus doesn't sit back with his disciples and go, yeah, you see Matthew? Yeah, I see him. Hey, what do you think we could do to help him? What do you think they need? How about we come up with a plan and then we'll just go give it to him? No, he goes to him. He engages with them. And it doesn't take a much imagination to assume the rest of the disciples were completely uncomfortable. Especially when their leaders and Sunday school teachers come up and say this. So when the Pharisees saw this, they asked the disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? You see, they knew Jesus was someone special. They knew he was doing great things, although Jesus didn't get along with them well. I mean, he condemned them quite a bit. He's wondering, we, we know you're someone special. We've seen the miracles. Why aren't you just hanging out with the elite? Why aren't you just hanging out with people, you know, rub elbows with us? We got the money. We got the power. Why don't you just hang out with us? But you see, Jesus was with the outcast. Jesus was with those who other people didn't care for. And the other disciples were right there with Jesus, not because they were comfortable, not because everyone would understand, not because even they were understanding. They went where Jesus went. They were hanging out with the people Jesus hung out with. They were engaging with them because Jesus was engaged with them. Pay attention. They didn't sit back and just condemn. And Christians, if there's one thing we got to get better at, it's condemning people who look different, act different. And I'm not talking about just color. I'm talking about dress or music or tattoos or you name it. We just look and we condemn and we condemn and we condemn. But Jesus was hanging out with them. Jesus was eating with them. Jesus was spending time with them, getting to know them. So Jesus heard their question. And you got to... It's so funny, the Bible, anytime somebody says something or thinks something, like he could read minds, it's very crazy. Anytime they said Jesus would answer their questions, like he pops from around the corner. It's like, oh, you thought, you thought I didn't know what was going on? And says, so this, on hearing this, Jesus said, it's not the healthy who need a doctor, 
but the sick. See, Jesus engaged with those who needed help. And as Christians, as followers of Jesus, we too are to engage with those in need. It's much easier to hang out with people who look like us, who sound like us, who have the same, perhaps, influence we have. I know that's easier, and I know that's comfortable. But we are called to be the light of the world. We are called to engage with people who are different. And Jesus engages with us. He pursues us. He identifies with us. And as followers of Jesus, we must know and we must understand that the gospel The gospel calls us to engage with others, pursue them, to seek them, to identify with them. And remember, well, I guess Jesus calls us to be friends with people who are different. And remember, knowing somebody's name doesn't make them a friend. Did we know that? Just because we know someone's name doesn't mean they're a friend. And for the younger generation, just because you're friends with them on Facebook doesn't make them a real friend. We know that? Yeah, yeah. Eat with them. Share a meal in their house together. Like that's the type of personal engagement Jesus had, and that's what he's calling us to do. If we want to deal with an injustice, whatever it may be, first, of course, we have to listen. Then we have to engage with the actual people because that's the only way we can do the next step, which is use our influence. Use our influence for the benefit of other people. Now, no one has to teach you, no one has to teach me to use my influence for my benefit, right? Did anybody have to teach you to use your wealth, your power, whatever influence is, all that it encompasses? Did anybody ever have to teach you to use that to benefit you? Yeah, that just comes natural. We're all about, yeah, I'm good. But Jesus, but God uses his influence for the benefit of other people. God not only engages with us, He dies for us, for our sin. And while not everybody will accept to accept his grace and come to him as Lord and Savior, nevertheless, he offers it and uses his power and his ability for us. You see, one of the great misunderstandings of salvation, if you've been saved, if you know Jesus Christ, just kind of lean in here this is a pretty big deal because one of the great misunderstandings is that our salvation has to do with only after we die as if salvation is the ticket I get so once I die then it applies but salvation is so much bigger than that salvation has to do with after you die but also right now because God has always wanted humans to have a great life in him In the very beginning, God created us, and it was good. He gave them all that they needed, all that they could ever want. We see in Deuteronomy 28, even after sin came into this world, that he made a covenant with them. And he says, if you obey me, you will be what? Blessed. But if you disobey me, what happens? A curse, that's Deuteronomy 20. Yeah, he's always wanted to bless us, as Scott was just talking about. He delights in giving us good things. Jesus says in John 10, 10, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. You see, Jesus' vision was never to have, to just save us out of this world. He came to establish the kingdom of God where his followers, where you and I could experience our true purpose, our true design, our true giftings, and our true talents under him. Remember, God did not create humans for heaven. He created us for earth. He created us to enjoy this. Heaven, that's where the angels and them live, not us. He created us to be here to experience this earth and all that it, well, offers. And then, of course, the negative is the sin, but he created us for earth. It's not, and as his followers, we should help people have a better life in Christ. The gospel has to be the center of everything we do. We'll never forget that. The gospel, knowing that people's greatest needs is salvation in Jesus Christ. That is everybody's primary need. We never want to detach our words from the message. The message is primary, the most important thing. 
But remember, Jesus also offers us joy, hope, peace. And we are to extend love to other people. We want to help them flourish with love, with hope, with joy, with peace. That's what it means to be kingdom people. As he reigns, we are with him helping other people and experience a great life in him and through him. And what's so amazing is Jesus didn't use his influence as we naturally would. Do you notice he doesn't come and conquer? He doesn't have this big army. He surely doesn't think getting a new elected person in the office is going to fix that. I can't wait to preach about that very soon. Just be ready for that, okay? It's coming. But he surely didn't think, hey, if I fix this government or I get a new system or, hey, you know what, maybe democracy or maybe we should do. Like he didn't do any of the things we revert to. What did Jesus use his influence to do? This is mind-blowing, isn't it? To die for you and I. He used his great influence with, to use sacrificial love. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. It's for God loved the world in this way. He shows us how he loves by how he died for us. And that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Romans 5.8. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died. See, the amazing thing about our faith is that although we were sinners, which means we were in the wrong, he pursues us and identifies with us and uses his influence for us. And he takes responsibility for our sin. He takes responsibility for what we have done and deals with it. Isn't that amazing? Surely he says, here's what you got. Here you got to repent. Surely this is what he says for sin. But he deals with the issue that's separating us. And then offers us a new and better, an abundant life in him. See, sacrificial love costs something, doesn't it? That's what's hard about it. If you've ever had kids or you're thinking about having kids, if you're thinking about having kids, it's way harder than it looks. I'm just going to throw that out there. Way harder than it looks. Where was I at? Not talking about kids anymore. Moving on. But sacrificial love, it costs something. It may cost time. It may cost treasure. It may cost your reputation. It may cause you at least, the very least, it may cost you to get a little bit uncomfortable. And that's Okay. And although it wasn't his fault, although it wasn't his problem, Jesus used his influence for the benefit of other people. And we too, as Christians, are called to show love to other people. And this love must come from our deeply rooted love for God. Out of our great love for others, he will push us to love others. And that's exactly what he did for us. Because the greatest injustice this world has ever seen, the greatest injustice, the biggest one, the largest one, is the sin you and I have committed against him. Because all sin is tied. It's, we usurped power. We said, oh, you're God, but I'm going to take power from you. I think I know what's right and what's wrong. When we sin, we are saying that we know better than him. Do you understand that? That's what it's always tied to, power. We usurp his role. We say we want it. All sin is completely tied to that. So the greatest injustice is that a created being who was built to manage on his behalf, the greatest injustice is saying, hey, I'm in charge. You just do what I need you to. You just stay over there, and when I'm in trouble, I'll, I'll ask you for help. When I need a new car or that new promotion or when I need something, I'll come to you then. The greatest injustice of the world is sin, but yet he engages us. He pursues us. He identifies us with us. And he used his influence on our behalf to give us an abundant life in him through his sacrificial love. And as followers of Jesus, we are commanded to continue his work in this world. We, too, must engage with people, all sorts of people. 
Because it's only through engagement and truly having a meal and sitting down and learning can we understand how we can use our influence the way God created us to help those in need. And I have to be completely just to the point here, so please hear me. If you're not interested in helping people in need, you've missed the gospel. I can't get any clearer than that. The gospel demands us to carry and help those in need and to show love. And we're called to messy situations. It's going to be messy. It's going to be difficult. But remember, it's the sick who need help. So if you find yourself asking, what can I do next? How can I help? The answer is completely and utterly different for each one of us. This is where we're going to have to remember that we are infilled with the Holy Spirit and should be led and guided by him. We can't sit back and wait. The next step is for you to engage with others. For our current situation, if that's something God's stirring in your heart, engage with people you don't know and engage with people that perhaps you're uncomfortable with. Perhaps they look different. Perhaps they're a different color. Perhaps they come from a different culture. Share meals with them. Ask questions. It's okay. And what this means is that for us, for you perhaps, standing on the outside, maybe asking how can I help, we have to be extremely careful not to prescribe to others what they must or should do. We have to be careful not to sit back while people in need are sitting there instead of talking or engaging, thinking that we can sit back and prescribe what every other person must do in any situation. We want to go to them and ask, how can I help? And for us as a church, just to let you know what we're doing and what we're trying to continue to do this Wednesday, as a church, we're having some local pastors come here. We're going to feed them. We're going to engage in a meal like we've been talking about. And we're going to start asking, how can our church help in this community? We're going to have different pastors come together and say, hey, what can we do? What or how can you? And we're just going to start talking. Churches, we got to start coming together more. And I'm sure you agree with that. So we're, we're going to start doing that. Pastors of different colors coming together to start having conversations about this. And so the next is use your influence. The amazing thing is just like when we talk about that each of us have a spiritual gift and each of us can contribute to the local church. Well, the same is true for the world and the same is true for any injustice that we're all different. We can all use our influence, how God created us, who he made us to be, to help in different ways. What that means is you don't have to become somebody else to get involved. God can use you exactly how he created you. If we are just faithfully present in our communities. For instance, some of you have amazing gifts, talents. And when you hear about an injustice and you engage with with certain communities and people, you say, hey, you know what? That's right up my alley. Best way I can help you understand is what happens at church. For instance, when I got here at the church, there were a couple of admin things we have to take care of, just one or two things, maybe a couple more than that. But there's some admin things we had to, to work towards, there's some different things I didn't know about. And luckily for us, I would just say, Bill, I need your help. And Bill Graham spent about 75 hours a week. I wish I was exaggerating there. But he stepped up and used his talents and his abilities to help. Just like you would use your talents and abilities to help the church, we can continue God's work, and he can use our talents and abilities to help those in need. Does that make sense? It doesn't just stop here. It can be anywhere because we are taking the presence of Christ with us into our community. Some of you have massive networks and you don't even know you have a big network. It doesn't even seem like you do, but you do. For instance, here at the church, we ever need a construction project or something's going on. I'll just be like, hey, McKenzie, who do you know? He has a massive network in that area. Some of you, you may be the connector. You may hear about an injustice or something going on in the world, and you may be the person to connect people. Did you know that's extremely valuable when people need help? Somebody who knows somebody? And the examples are endless. When it comes to an injustice, it's the same idea that it takes a community of people to stand up and work towards a better life for others. So perhaps you can't use your influence for everyone. What we've learned and what we've talked about is perhaps you could do for one what you could wish you could do for everyone. Engage in influence. See, 
I've told you this story, not this story, but when I was at the, the car wash, when I was the general manager of the car wash finishing up school, I told you I had a very hard time there because I knew God had called me into ministry, and I thought, well, I can't do ministry at the workplace. I mean, I have to do it in church. All right, like if I'm at church, that's where ministry happens out here. I mean, this is just work. I mean, God surely doesn't know what he's doing having me out here learning this kind of stuff. But I had a pastor, and it took quite a work on his behalf, but he taught me I could use my job to serve Christ. That every day I could carry my ministry with me and serve others and look for opportunities to be the presence of Christ in my community. And at my job, I had the most influence of anybody. I was the boss. I was a general manager. I could pretty much write policies and do what I wanted, but I chose it to help other people. And again, this is where it gets tricky because it's not one size fits all, right? Everybody has different jobs with different abilities, but you get the point. But one thing God placed on my heart when I was in that position was to help people in need, specifically help people who needed a second chance. And the thought process went like this. If I'd been redeemed and forgiven and God had forgiven me, perhaps I can help other people experience that in Christ. And so one thing I like to do is I like to hire felons. My owners didn't know this. We didn't get a special tax break for it. I just thought, hey, why not help them? Why not give people second chances? And so I, we, we did. I gave people all sorts of shot. Did it always work? Nope. But I can tell you it didn't always work with people who weren't felons either. You know what I mean? Y'all ever hired someone? Doesn't always work out, does it? Yeah, no, people, it's messy. But I didn't mind it. And I'll never forget the day that Paul came in. Paul was 6'2", about 220 pounds. And I don't, I don't get intimidated very easy, but he was a big dude. I mean, he was, just, he was just a big guy. I was like, okay. So he came in for this interview, and he talked, and he let me know right up front. He said, I am a felon. I said, okay. I said, for what? I, we're going to have to establish some trust here right off the bat. I said, for what? He said, when I was 18 years old, my friends were going out, and I participated in a drive-by with them. He said, the bullet I shot hit somebody and killed him. He just got out of prison for murder for 25 years. He'd been in prison longer than he'd been out. Y'all ever made any mistakes when you're 18? Yeah, perhaps not that bad, but just all depends on where you live usually and who your friends are. Well, he made that mistake, and so Paul, he continued to tell me the story, and I continued to talk with him, and I hired him on the spot. And that day, I saw this large, powerful man break down in tears that matched his size. I mean, they were like that big. I'm pretty sure they were huge tears. He just started crying in the office. He said, nobody would give me a chance. Nobody. And this isn't to brag on me. Please understand that. This was a long time ago. But I told him why. I said, I'm just showing what my Savior did for me. He loved me and forgave me and he'd given me plenty of chances. So the least I could do is extend it to you. And Paul, unfortunately, turned out to be a great worker because he didn't stay very long. Because of that job and he had some stability, he ended up getting on with a very good company who had a program and made really good money with great benefits. And I was so excited for him. I was disappointed to lose him but excited that God used that as a stepping stone for him to get real stability in life. You see, to me, a great injustice. Well, God just had me take a stand for people who had already paid their debt to society, but society wanted them to continue paying it. And I just thought it was great to help, and that's how I did it. And see, for you, it may be different. Whatever your presence is, whatever your influence is, however God uses you in this world, you can use those influences and those ability to help people. But you got to engage with them. you got to talk to them. you got to get to know them. And so how do we deal with an injustice? First, to listen. Next is the hard part, engagement. That's where it gets really uncomfortable. And then use your influence that he's given you to help a need because Christ has called us to that. That's the responsibility of every Christian. And we do this through Jesus. We do this because of Jesus, to help human beings flourish in this world. Because that's what he's asked us to do, and that's what he's provided. It's not easy, but it's the gospel in action. Will you pray with me? 
Gracious Heavenly Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus. Father, first we want to thank you for the great sacrificial love you showed by dying on that cross for our sins. That while we were sinners, you took that sin. You died in our place so we could live an abundant life in you. We're so grateful and thankful. And Lord, there's so many needs in this world. There's so many injustices. The world's not done with dishing those out. But as Christians, Lord, I pray that we can be your presence in our community. We can be your presence in all these different workplaces, all these different environments, and show your great love. And we thank you for that, and we just pray wisdom. We just pray that you help us understand what our next steps are, the people you'd like us to engage with, the risk you'd like us to take for the gospel. Lord, as you speak to us, we're going to listen. We're going to listen to you and then take those next steps. And Lord, we just pray as a church that we can be your presence. We pray that we can help fix the brokenness, always pointing them to you, Father. We love you and we thank you in the precious name of Jesus we pray. Amen.